Sage, Marissa Shorenstein. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for that introduction and for inviting me to participate in this summit where we can collectively discuss and debate the issues facing the technology sector and find ways to work together for the common good. AT&T came to life 140 years ago, which is about how much I feel I've aged since I joined the company. Just kidding. Like most startups, we had a good idea. Telephones but not very many customers. It's hard to think of AT&T as a startup, but the idea was sound. Build a network that makes communications with another person instantaneous, and we all know today it caught on. Telephones started as a luxury, but soon became a necessity. And while the underlying technology that supported the network evolved, the product remains relatively unchanged for over 100 years. Media also started as a communications technology. First, there was the printing press, then there was radio, and then there was television. The communications path for all of those was the same, from one person to many people. Unlike telephones, the transmission path, radio waves, was single direction. But the medium was powerful. You could sit in your home and listen to the radio or watch TV and get news instantaneously. Well, wireless and cell and cellular technology, and then, of course, the internet changed that equation dramatically and certainly accelerated the perhaps inevitable collision of media and communications. First, wireless cellular technology took telephone communications and introduced the concept of mobility. You didn't have to be at home to talk on the phone. You could be nearly anywhere. Then came the internet. It began as a vehicle to deliver email for most people which then evolved into information, social networks, shopping, music, video, you name it. It democratized communications, relationships, and political speech, for better or worse. And the marriage of wireless cellular with the internet broke down every communications barrier that ever existed. It is hard to imagine that the iPhone is merely 10 years old. The iPhone broke every network traffic forecast model that it came across. Since the iPhone was introduced in 2007, the data traffic on AT&T's network has grown 250,000%. And we're not just connecting your home computer and mobile phone and tablet anymore. We're connecting thermostats and refrigerators, watches and cars, shipping containers and lampposts. We're using the mobile internet to make houses smarter and cities smarter and shippers and businesses worldwide smarter. The demand is everywhere and is being driven by the consumers. And while we could not accurately forecast exactly where this consumer demand was going to land back in 2007, we quickly and accurately came to the conclusion that it was going to constantly grow. In fact, by 2020, there will be 25 billion connected things globally. Just think of some of the most interesting projects we're currently immersed in. The connected car, which will transform your commute, allowing you to take care of your daily to-do list by the time you've dropped your kid off at school. This technology actually makes me want to get a driver's license. But maybe with autonomous vehicles, I'll never need one anyway. Digital health, which is forever changing the delivery system of medical information to create a more seamless experience among doctors and between doctors and patients. Imagine watches that alert you and your doctor if your vital signs are off. How many of us can really say that we ever expected big data to help create efficiencies as far-reaching as giving local sanitation departments the tools to realign their truck patterns based on real-time information about which trash cans are full? Picture a neighborhood where streetlights gl glow brighter as you approach on your evening walk than dim as you move away. Think about a road that alerts you to dangerous conditions, allowing you to take action before an accident occurs. Amazing, but also very achievable. As the demand for connectivity grows, we are using new innovative ways to enhance the networks we so heavily rely on. 
We're working to deploy diversified technologies like small cells, distributed antenna systems, and fiber optics. We're even working on developing software-defined networks. All of this is necessary to fully unlock the potential of the Internet of Things and smart cities and prepare for the future of a 5G network. In particular, the deployment of small cell technology is critical to meet the increased demand for connectivity, enhance the network, and prepare for 5G network deployment. Small cells are low profile and unobtrusive and can be attached to existing utility poles, light poles on the sides of buildings. They make our network stronger by filling in any gaps, bringing our customers closer to a point of connection. This will provide a better, faster, and more reliable experience for our customers today and also provide key support for 5G connectivity tomorrow. The rapid change of our industry goes well beyond the implications of big data and smart cities. Back in 2014, AT&T was primarily a broadband company that also delivered IP video over a wired infrastructure to about 5 million U.S. households. We were also a significant mobile broadband provider, to be sure, with 100 million subscribers. But as to media and entertainment, however, we were a small domestic player in a large international market. In fact, our 2014 international interests were focused primarily on serving the communications needs of U.S. corporate enterprise customers abroad. Today I stand before you with a strong case to be made that we are of the face of the international convergence of communications, media, and entertainment that has long been predicted to occur in this market. Through our acquisition of DirecTV, our announced acquisition of Time Warner, which we hope to close sometime soon, and our significant investment in the mobile broadband market in Mexico, we are poised to become one of the leading mobile entertainment companies in the world. And if you ask anyone at AT&T how that happened, the response is likely to be a single answer, consumers. AT&T originally got into the video business with its Uverse TV product so that we could better compete with cable companies. We sold video in order to sell broadband to consumers. We were competing with the cable companies on a model that the cable companies built 30 years earlier. You all know the model because it migrated across the world. The cable company keeps adding channels and the price keeps increasing. More for more. As a video provider who started with zero customers, that was not a model on which we could effectively compete. We wanted to change that model. By starting with zero customers, it was hard to get the content company's attention. So we purchased DirecTV. Overnight, we became an international video distributor with 25 million US subscribers, but also an equal number of subscribers through properties in which we had ownership interest in Mexico and Latin America, 11 Latin American markets to be exact. Consumers are telling the market they want something different, content available whenever and wherever they want it. Changing a model, however, that has worked very well for the content video industry for 30 plus years has its challenges. People don't generally like to change. We needed a catalyst, so we announced our intent to acquire Time Warner. Our vision is to combine Time Warner's content with our video platforms and our mobile broadband network to deliver to consumers exactly what they want when they want it. With Time Warner, as one of the main content providers, we introduce DirecTV Now as a different way to view television content. DirecTV Now is the over-the-top application. It has no wires, no satellite connection, no set-top box. It is an app on your phone, your tablet, your smart TV, your Apple TV, your Amazon Fire, whichever you prefer. Clearly, part of the strategy in the Time Warner acquisition is to challenge the video market to create new and more consumer-specific video products for our customers, but we are also changing the way broadband is delivered as well. So what do we need to do to make all of this happen? Unprecedented investment. Over the past five years, to keep up with consumer demand, we've invested more than $140 billion in our wireless and wireline networks, more than any other U.S. public company. Where does that in level of investment rank among all investment in the United States? Right at the very top. We are, for the fourth year in a row, have invested more money in the United States than any other public company. And with Verizon Comcast and Time Warner Cable ranked in the top 20, the telecommunications sector leads the way in the U.S. when it comes to domestic capital investment. 
But it's not just about CapEx and investment alone. The communications industry, through those investment dollars, has created jobs throughout the country. And the jobs created by AT&T's investment to build a US broadband infrastructure were performed by union labor and an army of minority contractor firms. And of course, that investment in broadband infrastructure has enabled the US high tech industry to tr invest in innovation and create even more jobs. These investment dollars reverberate throughout the economy and are a critical component of both job creation and growth. The resulting expansion of broadband to more people everywhere creates a virtual cycle of innovation and investment that incentives, incentivizes wireless companies like ours to bring needed competition and choice to consumers. But as I have described to you earlier, the introduction of 5G will require even more investment. Think about this. In the more densely populated areas, 5G and small cell technologies will require those cells to be located every 200 meters. And each of those cells will require fiber backhaul. It's an enormous investment. Unless each of you has a couple hundred billion dollars lying around in the public coffers, that investment will largely come from the private sector. That means you need a modern pro-investment regulatory structure to att attract those dollars. In the United States, that has meant moving away from an 80-year-old Title II regulatory regime. It means not tying the hands of communications companies with a different set of rules than the large edge companies with whom we compete in this new world. AT&T continues to support the fundamental tenets of net neutrality, and we remain committed to open internet protections that are fair and equal to everyone. No blocking, no throttling, no censorship, and full transparency. Removing restrictive Title II regulations from broadband providers puts consumers, innovators, engineers, and entrepreneurs, not the government, back in the broadband driver's seat. The bipartisan, light-touch regulatory approach that Congress established in the Internet's inception brought American consumers unparalleled investment in broadband infrastructure, creating jobs and fueling economic growth. That is why we continue to support a legislative solution and will work with any interested members of Congress to achieve it. This is an important step toward leveling the playing field for all innovators, increasing broadband access for all Americans, and stoking the engine of innovation and investment again for all of our communities. Thank you so much.